Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. The topic of this lecture, as you can see on the slide, is English translations of Quran and an analysis. Uh, this topic has been divided into various uh, points. Point number one is uh, I'm going to explain the title of this uh, lecture. What do we mean by an analysis and English translations, etc. Number two is source text and target text oriented translations and then are followed by uh, uh, taking some examples of uh, of uh, these things like for grounding repetition of lexical items or phrases word order cultural bound items issues caused by literal translation and then verbal uh, idiomatic expressions and their translations syntactic semantic ambiguity and how to translate uh, uh, this ambiguity in pertaining to Quranic text and then this agreement among translators and of course the uh, you know emerging uh, issues from this disagreement and then translation transliteration of names and then concluding remarks so we have in total uh, 12 points to discuss in this uh, lecture but uh, you will see that this lecture as uh, the title suggests an analysis shall be a a practical analyzed uh, you know examples uh, sh shall be presented so first the title of the lecture the translations of the Quran uh, while discussing various translations uh, we shall be referring to these translations Piktal uh, Muhammad Marmaduk Mar Piktal the meaning of the Holy Quran and Ali is Abdullah Yusuf Ali the Holy Quran text translation and commentary Arbery Arthur John Aubrey, the Quran interpreted. Number four, Bell, Richard Bell, the Quran. Number five, Asad, Muhammad Asad, the message of the Quran. And Turner, Colin Turner, the Quran, a new interpretation. And number seven and last is Al Hilali and Khan, Muhammad Taqiyuddin uh, Al Hilali, and uh, Muhammad Muhsin Khan. And the title of their translation is Noble Quran. The second part of this title of our lecture is an analysis. What do we mean by uh, this uh, analysis here in this uh, context? We are going to see the tendencies of, of the translators to deal with the different issues and the problems and uh, the problems that are un encountered by the translators and how did they, uh, you know, uh, solve them or at least how did they try to uh, provide their own solutions etc and then this generally we shall also be uh, looking into the strategies and approaches and methods uh, uh, adopted by the translators and the features that reflect in their work that are the practical translations so with this uh, uh, you know understanding or meaning of the of, of the title of this lecture we can proceed further the source text and target text orientation in an oriented translation in the history of translation and now we can talk about the translation studies as well uh, the kinds of translation can be classified uh, uh, in the light of uh, different of course schemes but uh, in Quran in the context of Quran translation two major uh, you know um, streams are observed one is uh, uh, source text uh, target text uh, one is source text uh, oriented translation and the second is target text oriented translation what is source text oriented translation strategies and approaches actually they are the uh, when the translator follows uh, the word order the styles and the structure of the source text that is source text oriented translation and while translating ignores uh, the requirement of, uh, of, uh, of of the target text whereas on on, on contrary to that target text oriented uh, translation strategies and approaches are you know the opposite of the source text uh, uh, oriented uh, translation strategies where the main consideration in the mind of the translator is to take care of the requirement of the target text you know the structure the grammar the style the word order etc our third point is foregrounding so what is foregrounding foregrounding uh, of course we are talking about in the context of arabic language and the quranic arabic 
is uh, we see the normal sentence order here is the verb or subject and then prepositional phrase which is here kharajtu which is uh, a verb and the subject here min is the prepositional uh, you know the preposition and minal bait is the prepositional phrase so this is the normal order in the language but when it is reversed or it is foregrounded in 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 the way that the prepositional phrase is uh, of course foregrounded and the verb and the subject followed by verb and the subject as we can see here min al bayti kharajtu so kharajtu min al bayti i left uh, i left the house and then min al bayti from the house i went out so foregrounded order of course uh, is not the uh, you know normal uh, 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 usage in the language but when it is uh, uh, when it is foregrounded, I mean, when, when it is uh, used in this way, as you can see, min al bayti kharajtu, it has some semantic purpose behind it. Another, uh, you know, there are uh, prepositions uh, in, in Arabic, min, fi, bi, ila, ala. These are just uh, additional information for uh, yourself to ponder on. Another, uh, you know, uh, example of the foregrounded is the foregrounded object where the normal order is the verb plus subject and object. Uh, the example is qara'a talibu al kitaba the student read the book. But uh, when it, this normal order is foregrounded like this one, uh, the foregrounded uh, object here is object becomes the first and then followed by the verb and the subject. Al kitaba qara'ahu al talib the book is read by the student or the, it is the book uh, you know that uh, you know reads uh, uh, the student it's a little very little uh, translation of the foregrounded object so the concept should be very clear where the order of the normal sentence uh, which is verb subject object is changed for some uh, you know for the purpose of meaning so what is the purpose here for that purpose preserving the uh, source text tone splendor and stylistic speciality in translation of course preserving the deep intended semantic properties so uh, let's see uh, the uh, concrete example from the holy quran min nutfatin khalaqahu and before we go to the translations uh, uh, you know the normal order if we want to uh, know the what is the normal order of the sentence of the words here is like that khalaqahu min nutfatin he has translated it uh, from a sperm drop but the translators here, Ali Asad and Arbery, all these three translators, they have retained the source text order, which is uh, prepositional foregrounding. Min Nutfatin from a sperm drop, uh, as for Ali's translation is concerned, and then Asad from a drop of seed and Arbery of a sperm drop. So why they have retained this, uh, you know, uh, prepositional foregrounded? Uh, order in the Quran because as I said earlier the purpose there are two basic purpose for that in the minds of the translators they want to preserve source text tone splendor and stylistic speciality why because this is a religious and revealed text so they give uh, of course uh, due respect to the order of the words uh, that are found in the revealed text. The second purpose is to preserve the deep intended semantic properties. So if we say he has he created it from a sperm drop, it has a different impact in the minds of the reader, I mean, the different semantic properties. But if uh, the order is as it is in the Quran, Minutfatin Khalaqahu from a sperm drop, he had created or from a drop of seed he created him or of a sperm drop he created him that means the focus is on the the word nutfa which is from a sperm drop to to attract the minds of the humanity and the readers and the audience to ponder on the the creation process or at least the status of a human being uh, how uh, he has been created by the Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we can uh, take the example of foregrounded object, which is in Arabic we would say maf'ul bihi muqaddam, and uh, the verse or part of the verse that we have, wal arda ba'da dalika dahaha, 
والأرض which means the earth بعد ذلك which means after that دحاها extended to a wide expanse دحاها expanded it to a wide expanse so you know if 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 I'm try to I've tried to do for the sake of understanding to bring it into the normal order of Arabic languages it would be like that بعد ذلك دحا الأرض دحا الأرض which is this you know the بعد ذلك this phrase and then the the subject and of course the I mean the verb and the subject is embedded into that and الأرض which is the object but here in in the Quranic of course the construction here the uh, the object uh, is before before even the verb and the the subject so let's see how it has been translated ali has translated and the earth moreover which is uh, translated translation of ba'da zalika had he extended and within the bracket to a wide expanse however asad and piktal they have uh, followed the target uh, language uh, i mean target text uh, oriented translation they have provided this kind of translation and after that, they are starting with Ba'da Dalika, uh, the earth, although, you know, the Asad is bringing uh, the, the object before the, uh, the verb. So, wide has he spread its expanse and Piktal and after that he spread the earth. So, now we see that the Piktal is following the target text order. But Asad has, of course, uh, you know, uh, in between Ali and uh, uh, Piktal where he is following the uh, source text order, uh, uh, I mean the target text order uh, in the beginning where he says that and after that and then he follows the source text order which is the earth why he has spread its expand. Okay, this, the fourth point in this lecture is the repetition of lexical items or phrases and repetition of the same pr pronoun. Here we have uh, one uh, Quranic verse uh, which is like that in Nani and Allah la ila illa ana fa'budni so here we have uh, pronouns uh, in Nani ana and then ana and then ni so we have uh, uh, four pronouns in one verse uh, which apparently looks that it is uh, perhaps is uh, repetition but this repetition of course has some uh, of uh, some purposes uh, uh, you know embedded in this uh, in this uh, style so let's first see how the arbri asad and al hilali and khan has translated this uh, this verse arbri says verily i am and i am god there is no god but i which is la ilaha illa ana therefore serve me fa'budni asad said uh, uh, verily i alone am god there is no deity save me hence worship me alone and Al Hilali and Khan, verily I am Allah, la ilaha illa ana. None has the right to be worshipped but I within the bracket. So worship me. So we see that the pronoun, as I said earlier, refer to the same Allah. That innani, ana, ana, ni, all these four pronouns actually they are referring to the word mentioned here in this uh, verse Allah. So this repetition is for the semantic reason. So we have, uh, you know, two uh, uh, propositions, not prepositions, so two propositions. I mean, uh, two things here. One is about knowing God and his existence. So please read this proposition, not preposition. So first proposition is about knowing God and his existence. That is, that is in nani, in nani, and Allah. Nani and Allah. This is the first proposition, and the second proposition is about knowing the oneness of God and that He alone is worthy of worship. Where La ilaha illa ana fa'budni. So this is the reason why we see uh, four, uh, you know, same pronouns repeated here. And the purpose, as you can see here, is in the first part. It is, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know uh, the purpose to know that uh, that Allah is the God and his existence to ascertain that and the second is to know that he is one 
a god and he is the only one god and he alone is worthy of worship another example of this uh, repetition of lexical item phrase phrase and we have here the phrase repetition of the same phrase with a buffer word so the quranic verse wa yawma tajidu kullu nafsin ma amilat min khairin muhdaran wa ma amilat min su'in uh, let me first uh, you know explain this uh, 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 this example here so ma amilat min khairin ma amilat has been mentioned here and after the word muhdaran again wa ma amilat is repeated here so repetition of the same phrase with a buffer word so which what is the buffer word here it is muhtaran and we will see why and what is the significance of this buffer word here and the repetition so pictal translates this in in this way on the day when every soul will find itself confronted with all it hath done of good and all that it hath done of evil asad on the day when every human being will find himself with all the good and that he has done and with all the evil that he has done i mean this ma amilat min khairin muhdaran wa ma amilat min su'in so let's see why this is the value of this buffer word and the repetition of ma amilat so there are two things so buffer word muhdaran separates the first ma amilat min khairin uh, from the second ma amilat min su'in of course ma amilat min khairin is the good that the human being does and ma amilat min su in the evil that is of course done by the human being so word muhdaran uh, uh, you know be, uh, has been uh, has has come in in between the repetition of ma amilat min khairin and wa ma amilat min su in so separating the two clauses so without this separation if it has not been separated the meaning of the verse is impaired uh, the second part of the verse which is tawaddu law anna bainaha wa bainahu amadan ba'ida which means every soul will long that there might be a mighty space of distance uh, you know as translated by pixel but the point here is number one as i have explained earlier that the importance of this muhdaran which separates the two classes uh, becomes clear when we see the remaining part of the verse tawaddu law anna bainaha wa bainahu amadan ba'ida the pronoun in bainahu which is who refers to su most adjacent to a wide semantic ambiguity because you know if if uh, if if it is not this verse here ma amilat min khairin muhdaran wa ma amilat min su in if it is not separated ma amilat min khair wa ma amilat min su it, if it is not separated by the word muhdaran it would create an, an, an ambiguity uh, in, in understanding the quranic verse so that that is the significance of the word muhdaran which comes in between the two repeated phrases here and also it becomes very clear when we see the pronoun who which is baina who here in this verse it refers to su which is very near which is the nearer to to, because it refers to su in which is most adjacent to this pronoun uh, and the purpose behind it to avoid semantic ambiguity point number five which is the word order which is uh, also very important and uh, the example in front of us lies tawi ashabun nari wa ashabul jannati we see that the initial negative particle la followed by the verb fine ali translating and following the uh, type, uh, source text order and translating in this way not equal or the companions of the fire and companions of the garden so source language order is retained in Ali's translation and Asad again not equal are those who are destined for the fire and those who are destined for the paradise so again both Ali and Asad they are following the uh, source language source text order which is which starts with the La Yastavi and it has of course uh, it has a, it has some uh, semantic significance as well so what is the what is the what the, they are attempting to retain the sensitive word order of source language uh, the turner however uh, has translated this verse in this way the companions of the hellfire and the companions of the gardens of heavens are not equal so turner is following the target language order for uh, of course different uh, purposes 
Number six, uh, which is very you know rich aspect of uh, Quran translation, is the cultural bound items. And cultural bound item means the words that are very much specific in the culture of a source language. Uh, that culture might be social culture, or maybe religious culture, or maybe geographical culture, political culture, and so on and so forth. So the culture has also been classified uh, into different categories according to you know the different aspects of that culture so when we talk about the culture bound uh, uh, items in quran we are talking about the uh, the uh, the quranic uh, concepts of course that are very much intangible and abstract metaphors terms specific words that are related to uh, you know different things so in in this example which is here in nahaza akhi lahu tis'un wa tis'una na'ja wa liya na'jatun so tis'una na'ja and the last one wa liya na'jatun or the first one all translated avoided cultural adaptations what is that cultural adaptation is that instead of translating the word na'ja uh, you know literally uh, that is meant in the in the source text translate it into uh, into the target uh, text in a way which is uh, which brings the meaning at least uh, for the for the readers so they have avoided this cultural adaptation so naja has been translated with the word you by ali al hilali and khan bell piktal arbery and turner so they have not tried to substitute uh, this word you uh, with seal and pig of course related to the uh, this could be a kind of cultural adaptation or related to the approach which is known as ethnographic approach uh, in the translation study so they have avoided because of of, of the of the sacredness of, of the text another example of the cultural bound items is the uh, so turner has translated is ihram robe that is transliteration ihram plus english word Ali Pilgrim Gab, which is translation, and he has also provided a marginal note. Al, uh, Al Hilali and Khan, Ihram for Hajj or Umrah. Well, we can see that there is a translation. At the same time, uh, he they are providing the explanation. So, this uh, strategy adopted by uh, these translators actually, the variety of strategies are here. Uh, we have uh, three uh, interrelated uh, words here in these uh, Quranic verses. So Fatila, Naqira, and Kitmir. So the cultures that are not familiar with the date stones will find it difficult to understand all these three words. So there is a problem now, a challenge, uh, you know, faced by the translators. So let's see how the English translators uh, that we are discussing, uh, whom we are discussing here in this lecture, uh, dealt with this uh, with this uh, you know uh, issue. So we see that the bell has uh, translated uh, the fatila with a straw and pictal here upon a date stone, asad a hair's breadth, arbory single date thread, ali little thing. So we see here that uh, the most of the translators uh, they are trying to follow the source text. Uh, you know, I mean the word used in the culture of the source text. But Ali is trying to take the you know, the practical aspects. Of what is the intended meaning? And he's translating it with little thing. Nakira has been translated by uh, Bell as as a uh, speck and uh, pixel speck on a do date uh, stone. Arbery single date spot asad groove of a date stone and ali farthing which is of course a kind of uh, you know penny which means penny you know he, again he is uh, you know his tendency is towards uh, towards clearing making the meaning easier for the target readers as he has done in fatila in the case of fatila and here again in nakira we will see that kitmir uh, Pictal white spot on a date stone. It is a wrong translation, of course. Arbery a skin of date stone, and Asad husk of a date stone. But Ali again, in as he has done in Fatila and Nakira, is uh, you know opting the way which uh, makes the meaning uh, simple for the target reader, least power. So Mayam Likuna Min Kitmir they that they possess least power according to. Abdullah Yusuf Ali's translation. 
seven issues caused by literal translation so there are issues that are you know arising from uh, when we see that the translators they have uh, adopted uh, the method of literal translation so la mastumun nisa pixar has translated have touched women which is a literal translation and it poses a big problem because this part of the the verse has uh, occurred in the context of uh, of uh, of conditions for praying and in which conditions one should not pray so if it means have not touched the woman la so it has uh, it has very uh, you know uh, different implications for the followers for the muslims but asad have of course uh, not of course uh, followed the literal translation he has actually taken the intended meaning and uh, uh, and hence he has translated have cohabited with women another example is waqfud janahaka lil mu'minin again we see that the arbi uh, has translated and lower thy wing unto believers of course this is a very literal uh, translation of uh, this verse and it causes uh, you know a hinder kind of hinder, hinders uh, between the source text and the readers another example is so how to translate for how to translate the word um here um uh, usually means in arabic uh, mother but the literal translation becomes a hindrance to the full understanding of the quranic text uh, the uh, the uh, different interpretations by uh, exig exigers and uh, mufassirin as uh, we see that the asad translating this word um as an abyss with footnote uh, of course taking from al qurtubi pictal translating is mother only literal meaning arbari womb which is again a literal but very remote literal meaning and ali and uh, hilali khan of course have uh, translated this with home and they are taking from Zamakhshari. Likewise, Turner, he has also uh, taken the meaning from Zamakhshari, has translated with abode, which is home. Again, another example is La Yazuquna Fiha Bardan Wala Sharaba, meanings of Bard and how to translate it. And uh, of course, Al Qurtubi provided the meaning of birth. So there are two meanings of birth one is coolness, and the other is sleep. So most uh, translators have translated uh, this word with the word coolness, uh, uh, taking into account the core text of the expression sharaba. So there is uh, water or, uh, you know, uh, something for uh, to drink uh, and then barda and the coolness and of course something to to drink. But the if it is translated with sleep can also be taken as an essential element of earthly existence with water because without water uh, uh, life cannot be imagined and without sleep life can also be uh, you know cannot be uh, imagined. But anyways, this uh, the other meaning sleep is also there, and this of course. Um, uh, uh, approach of translating the word literally or keeping into the uh, the 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 core text or the word occurring uh, in the same uh, verse uh, it has a different meaning and but if it is translated with the second option it will provide a different interpretation and different of course uh, uh, meaning another example of the of, of the issues caused by literal translation uh, in this verse amanu imanum so literal meaning of zulm means wrongdoing and evil doing pixal bell ali arbri and asad all relying on the literal meaning so they are just trying, uh, translating this word with the uh, wrongdoing or evil doing or the words that are very similar or synonyms to these two words uh, meaning should be determined by intertextual exegesis we see that the al qurtubi asyuti they have explained the word uh, zulm here which means to to worship other besides god which means shirk so they have relied on the intertextual references one of them is the this ya bunayya la tushrik billah inna shirk la zulmun azimun so the word zulm has been uh, used in the context of shirk which is of course worshiping other than uh, god or allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Ali and uh, Khan and Turner they have translated according to this meaning and this has also been explained by different uh, of Mufassirin. 
Number eight is verbal idiomatic expressions and the problems uh, encountered by the translator. So it's uh, it's uh, the example ara aita ara aita, which literally means as has been translated by Pixar and Arbery, didst thou see and what thinks thou? But the, the, the deep understanding of the context of uh, this uh, idi verbal idiomatic expression in Arabic, uh, we can infer that it is uh, uh, it, it is similar to uh, what we use in English, that is, well, you see. So it is not didst thou see, or it's not what thinks thou in the shape of a question, actually, it's well, you see. Uh, the, 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 the phrase that is used in, uh, uh, in, in, in the English language. Another verbal uh, idiomatic expression, another example, فَرَجَعُ إِلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ فَقَالُوا So, رَجَعَ إِلَىٰ is idiomatic expression. رَجَعَ إِلَىٰ نَفْسِهِ means to engage in self-appraisal or to subject yourself to scrutiny as it has been explained by, by these two Mufassirin, uh, Al-Suyuti and Al-Qurtubi. Uh, but we see that the uh, translators here, Bell, Arbery, Ali, uh, they have uh, uh, translated uh, literally. So, they say they... Uh, turned to each other and said uh, Arbery so they returned to uh, uh, one another and Ali so they turned to themselves and said so all these are literal translations and uh, of course they they do not uh, completely uh, um, uh, reveal the the deep meaning of uh, this uh, idiomatic expression in Arabic Number nine is syntactic and semantic ambiguity, and we can take uh, example here. Uh, number one, ex the first example is improper chunking that can lead to wrong translation. So here, in this uh, famous verse or controversial uh, as for the translation or the interpretations are concerned, either we stop here or we continue reading this so let's see so we have uh, two different uh, here translations according to single chunk as without stopping here illallah we write we read or we recite wa ma ya'lamu ta'wilahu illallah wal rasikhuna fil ilmi yaquluna amanna bihi kullu min 'indina so the translation uh, according to this uh, you know uh, no, I mean the one, of course, uh, uh, one recitation without any pause, but no one knows its hidden meanings except God and those who are firmly grounded in knowledge who say and then we complete it. That means uh, no one knows its hidden meanings except God and those who are firmly grounded. So here uh, they are also the, the, the hidden meanings are known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, this is the eternal reality and those uh, who are firmly grounded in knowledge if we follow uh, this uh, single chunk. But if we follow uh, this reading with two chunks, with pause after the word Allah, as I said earlier, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهُ And then we have a pause here and then we say وَالرَّاسِقُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ يَقُولُونَ آمَنَّا بِهِ كُلُّ مِّنْ عِنْدِ رَبِّنَا uh, according to this reading, the translation would be like that. But no one knows its hidden meanings except God. And then there is a the full stop. And those who are firmly grounded in knowledge, they say, uh, we we believed, we have believed in uh, in whatever is revealed uh, to, to the Prophet. Everything is from our Lord. Another example of syntactic and semantic ambiguity is the word al-jamal in this Quranic verse hatta yali jal jamalu fi sammil khiyati. So ambiguous meaning of al-jamal. So al-jamal uh, it has been translated uh, uh, with the famous uh, meaning of this word is camel by Bell, Pictal, Arbery, Ali, Al-Hilali Khan and Turner. But al-jamal also has been translated uh, by uh, with the word twisted rope which has been the, this meaning has been translated uh, by Zamakhshari. It has been provided by Zamakhshari and al qurtubi and taken by Asad in his translation. So, uh, you know, this uh, twisted rope and the camel, so a lot of difference in the, in the meaning. Uh, so, both are trying to, of course, uh, uh, clarify this uh, semantic ambiguity in this word. 
Another example of this, uh, the cementing ambiguity is a shaytani aidukumul faqra wa amurukum bil fahsha. So the word al fahsha uh, has been translated as indecency by Arbery and uh, to be niggardly. And he is taking from al zamakhshari, which is to be miser. So the difference is very clear between these two translations. And they are they are both are trying to, uh, you know, the the uh, erase that ambiguity in the meaning of al fahsha in this context another example wa innahu li hubbil khair la shadiz how to translate the word al khair it has been translated with wealth by asad but with fast horses and good things by turner arbery respectively the uh, point number 10 in this lecture is disagreement among the translator so certain expressions need special relevance to the quranic exegesis as i think this point has been uh, you know emphasize time and again in this lecture so no agreement on the meanings leads to an excessive over translation we take only one example here the word as samad and Bikthal say the eternally be sought of all so they are trying to actually uh, 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 explain the meaning as samad here as samad is a great challenge for the mufassirin and the translators alike asad has translated the eternal the uncaused cause of all being arbury the everlasting refuge ali the eternal absolute if we just ponder in the translations of these piktal asad arbury and ali uh, here in this slide we find that actually they are uh, they are uh, they are perhaps uh, you know excessive over they are providing excessive over translations so one word as samad has been translated with uh, in Pictal translation with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and Asad is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and Arbery 1, 2, 3 and uh, Ali is uh, you know using three words for uh, for the translation of this this word so uh, this is another uh, aspect of, uh, of, of, of the Quran translations uh, observed in English here 11 is transliteration and translation of the names so here we have only two examples what is transliteration transliteration means that the translator is not translating i mean not tra transferring the meaning of the source text word into the target text language so he is actually uh, transliterating writing and uh, you know in the scripture of the target language like the names if the name is salsabila and sijin so it is written as sal sabila s a l s i b double e l a like that so it is called transliteration so in this uh, in the example of sal sabila asyuti says that is a name of fountain in paradise and sijin is a name of palace for the souls of unbelievers uh, a name of place i'm sorry to it's a name of place not a palace place for the souls of unbelievers so majority what we see in the English translators or translations that the majority of translators they transliterate it without footnote. However, we we see that uh, Ali provided brief, informative, uh, exegetical footnotes with the transliteration of these both words, and Asad opted for only translation without a footnote for the word Sal Sabila, which uh, translated by him as. Uh, seek thy way and translation with a footnote for Sijin set down in a mode inescapable. So in Asad's case, of course, he is not taking Sansabila and Sijin as the as the uh, as something in as is in, as if they are names mentioned in Quran. Rather, he is trying to translate or to decipher the meanings of these these words. The last point in this lecture concluding remarks so let's see what uh, we have very quickly discussed in the previous slides so we try to conclude uh, here no english translations by muslims non-muslims has brought the quran near to the hearts and minds of people raised in a different religious social and psychological climate here of course we are talking about the english-speaking countries and europe in general and the west what is known as west Quranic usage is marked by you know many things, especially by richness, variety, discernment, subtlety, precision, and consistency. And rendering such unique usage into a linguistically distinct uh, target language is a big challenge, just like English and other European languages, because the background is different, because the cultures are different, and so on. 
Translators are accounted, English translators, of course, are accounted with several problems. Major problems are cultural bound items, idiomatic expressions, deep rooted motive, uh, emotive words, not motive, emotive words, and ambiguity. Lack of competence in Arabic syntax and morphology, semantics, stylistic, pragmatics, and figurative aspects of Quranic language are uh, other reasons on part of the translators, which create, of course, a kind of hindrance between the understanding of the Quran and also uh, uh, the real meaning of uh, uh, intended uh, real meaning intended meaning in the Quranic text and between the audience and the readers that specially belong uh, to a different culture and different uh, of course um, uh, um, uh, different cultural or linguistic you know uh, background semantic representation of source text into a target text is possible and yani meanings can be uh, transferred possible to some extent or in other cases to large extent in religious texts we must say to some extent but stylistic properties are a real challenge for the translator of uh, of the religious revealed text so what are the, what is the uh, usual uh, strategy adopted by the translators usually they adopt formal overloading which is source text oriented uh, approach for the translation of the Quranic text along with an archaic language so they they prefer to use these two to avoid the criticism so literal translations pose a hindrance in the understanding of Quranic message sometimes non-reliance of translators on the Quranic exegesis the fasir lead towards uh, under translation sometimes over translation sometimes wrong translation so uh, for to for some of the scholars they have suggested the solutions and I think this solution is partially very good some scholars and translators think that the best way is to translate plus provide a tafsir or uh, get information uh, from uh, the authentic tafsir and commentary written in the target language so that uh, the last uh, suggestion is a kind of a solution uh, which can be adopted by the uh, translators of Quran into English language. With this, this lecture ends and uh, we may have a lot of uh, questions because, uh, uh, you know, this uh, presentation uh, ha has been very uh, brief and uh, a little bit, you know, we, we, we wanted to save our time. But welcome to your questions, queries and your comments. In, for this lecture. Thank you very much. Take uh, very good care of yourself. Assalamu alaikum.